every once in a while in our English Bibles, we come across what appears to be an unfortunate chapter division, and this may be one of those instances. Usually a chapter division indicates a new idea or a new subject, but in this case, chapter 4 is a continuation of what was introduced in chapter 3. In chapter 3, the author of Hebrews quoted from Psalm 95 to urge his hearers to enter into God's rest. And here in chapter 4, he is going to urge that even further. In fact, the word rest occurs nine times in the passage that we're focusing on this morning. And here we see the theme of God's rest worked out in detail. We find an urgent plea to make sure we have entered into it. This passage continues the warning that was begun in chapter 3, verse 7, and it likely addresses those Jews of his day that were right on the verge of salvation but had fallen short of receiving it. They had heard the gospel, and they may have been intellectually convinced of its truth, but they had not yet put their commitment in saving faith to Jesus Christ. And perhaps the pressure and the tradition of Judaism was keeping them from making this commitment, but the warning is that failing to commit to Christ will lead to the loss of eternal life. And of course, This applies to anyone, to Jew or Gentile, anyone who might fall short of coming to complete saving faith in Christ. The warning applies to anyone who might be hesitating to repent of sin and to embrace Christ as Savior and Lord. It would apply to anyone who is putting it off for a more convenient time or anyone who might be looking for more proof or evidence, or anyone who might be unwilling to let go of a sinful lifestyle. And the message is, you don't know how long you have. You don't know if you will be given another opportunity. So today, if you hear the voice of God calling you to salvation, don't harden your heart but respond in saving faith. Or another way we could say this is don't forfeit God's eternal rest because of unbelief. Don't do like the Israelites in the wilderness and harden your heart in unbelief and rebellion. Now, Hebrews 4, 1 through 11 that we read a few minutes ago is a very difficult passage. George Guthrie calls this one of the most fascinating, enigmatic, and tightly argued sections of Hebrews. It is not easy to outline, and it's not easy to interpret. We have to walk through it carefully. And one critical issue that must be dealt with first is the identification of what the author is referring to when he talks about rest. Bible scholars have spilled a lot of ink on this one, and there is not always agreement. Now, I'm going to do the best I can with it, but let me start by just ruling a couple of things out. First of all, I think we have to acknowledge that what the author of Hebrews is speaking of here is more than just physical rest. It is true that he's going to use two different words for rest in this passage, and one of those words is connected with the word for the Sabbath. However, the passage as a whole implies much more than just resting on the Sabbath. In fact, I would say that anyone who takes this passage and makes it an admonition to keep a literal Sabbath observance is abusing this text. Any preacher, for example, who would 
preach from this passage that we should refrain from any work on Sunday is totally missing the point. And of course, Sunday is not the Sabbath, but that's the way it usually gets applied. This passage is not about resting on Sunday or on Saturday. Secondly, I believe it is equally problematic to see this rest as something solely eschatological. In other words, there are those who see this rest as being equivalent to heaven. Certainly, we know that the eternal aspect of God's rest includes heaven, but what we see from this passage is that it is something that is attained in the present. If this rest is only attained in heaven, how could the author of Hebrews speak of it as something some of them had already fallen short of and others had already entered into? In fact, if this rest is only a reference to heaven, we would have to say that they had all fallen short of it because none of them were in heaven yet. Guthrie says, although elements in Hebrews point to the attainment of God's promises in the future, the present appropriation of God's rest must be considered an aspect of the author's concern. This is part of that already not yet element of biblical doctrine. Christian realities have already been inaugurated, but have not yet been fully consummated. So the rest spoken of here is something that a believer enters into now, but it will not reach its fullness until that final destination in the future. And even though it is true that the author uses a different Greek word for rest in verse 9, the way it is used in the context seems to imply that these two terms are really referring to the same thing, as we'll see. Now, although the primary word, kataposis, has a range of meanings, it's used in this passage to refer to the concept of ceasing from one's labor. In verse 10, this is clearly applied to the doctrine of saving grace. As John MacArthur puts it, God's rest is the end of legalistic works and the experience of peace in the total forgiveness of God. In fact, there are several things I think we can say for certain about what this rest entails that come directly from the text. Number one, it is a rest that we should be fearful not to miss. And we see that in verse 1. Second, it is a rest that some are in danger of missing as a result of a lack of faith. We see that in verse 2. Third, it is a rest that consists of ceasing from one's own work, and we see that in verse 10. Fourth, it is a rest that a person must enter now, and we see that all throughout this passage, but especially in verse 7. Now, we're going to come back and see this in more detail as we walk through it, but with all this in mind, let's move now into the text. And I've broken this down into five divisions. The first one is the promise. Look with me at verse 1. Therefore, let us fear, lest while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you should seem to have come short of it. The word therefore refers to what he talked about in the previous chapter and the application of Psalm 95. It refers historically to Israel's unbelief and failure to enter into God's Canaan rest. But here, it is being applied spiritually to his own audience. He's saying that a promise of rest still remains for them and that they should fear coming short of it. 
In the same way that the Israelites that came out of Egypt lost their opportunity to enter the promised land because of unbelief, in the same way there is danger in the spiritual realm of coming short of entering God's eternal salvation. This was applicable for those in the first century. It is still applicable today. The verb that is translated come short is a word that means to fail to reach or to miss a goal. This is very similar to the idea of missing the safe harbor that was alluded to in chapter 2 and verse 1. This verb also includes the aspect of being excluded from something as a result of missing it. And by the way, this is the one thing Jesus said we should fear. He said in Matthew 10, 28, Do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. For most people today, the greatest fear is the fear of death. But Jesus says there's something we should fear more than that. In fact, he would say we would we should not fear those who might have the power to take our life physically, but we should fear God because he alone has the power to send us to hell eternally. In other words, spiritual death is a much greater issue. Our eternal destiny must be the highest priority. Our greatest fear should be that we don't miss out on God's eternal salvation. But on the positive side, the author of Hebrews declares, a promise remains of entering his rest. As long as we are in this age of grace... A person can enter into salvation rest through saving faith in Jesus Christ. In fact, it does not matter what you have done or how evil you have been. There remains for you a promise of entering God's salvation rest. In his commentary on Hebrews, John MacArthur tells the story of a man named Jerry McCauley. This man was about as wicked as a man could get. He was an alcoholic, and his children were starving because he would spend all of their money on booze. His little girl died of malnutrition when she was about four, and the neighbors took up a collection, and they got enough money to buy the little girl uh, some new clothes and a casket for the funeral. But this man broke into the mortuary at night and took the clothes off his dead child to sell them to buy another drink. Soon after that, he was gripped with such conviction, and he received Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. He went on to become one of the greatest preachers that America has ever known. My friend, listen. As long as God gives you an opportunity to choose Christ, you still have hope. You can still repent and believe the gospel and receive eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. In fact, there's only one sin, according to the Bible, that cannot be forgiven, and that is, in essence, the sin of rejecting Christ. But as long as it is still today... As long as you can hear his voice, the voice of the Spirit of God, calling you to repentance and salvation, you can still be saved. You can still enter into God's salvation rest. By the way, notice that verse 1 implies that some will enter into God's rest while others will fall short of it. You need to make sure you don't fall short of entering God's rest. Another, by the way, notice the word seem there in verse 1. Why does he say that it seems as if some may fall short of it? What is that? What is he talking about there? 
it, apparently it has to do with the fact that there were some who were giving no evidence of true spiritual regeneration. Some were going back into Judaism and forsaking Christianity. Some were not holding fast the beginning of the assurance of the faith firm to the end, as we saw in chapter 3, verse 14. Their falling away was giving evidence that they had fallen short of responding to the gospel with genuine saving faith. But look at verse 2. For indeed, we have had good news preached to us, just as they also But the word they heard did not profit them because it was not united by faith in those who heard. The word for good news there in the New American Standard is often translated gospel. For the original audience, this referred to the message of salvation, which was a spiritual application of what occurred in the Old Testament. Those being addressed by the author of Hebrews had heard the good news of the gospel. They knew about Christ. They knew uh, all he had done to save them eternally. In the Old Testament context, the good news had to do with the promise of entering into Canaan, but here it is being applied to the Christian message of salvation. And from a human perspective, saving faith is required to attain this salvation. Just hearing the gospel is not enough. You have to respond with saving faith. In the same way that the ancient Israelites failed to enter the promised land because of a lack of faith, so people today can fail to enter into God's salvation rest through a lack of faith. Hearing the good news of the gospel does you no good at all unless that hearing is united with saving faith in Christ. Now the phrase, united by faith, can be translated mixed with faith. And J. Adams uses the illustration of a chemical reaction. He says you can place certain chemicals side by side, but nothing will happen until you mix the two together. But when you do that, in certain cases, it can have a very strong reaction. In the same way, if the hearing of the gospel is not mixed with saving faith, nothing will happen. But when it is mixed with saving faith, it makes an eternal difference. Look at verse 3. For we who have believed enter that rest. Stop right there for just a moment. This is the positive side. The ones who have believed do, in fact, enter into that salvation rest. This rest is for those who have saving faith. A.T. Robertson says the word enter is an emphatic, futuristic, present, middle, active verb. Now, that basically means that there's no question at all that they enter into God's rest. That's what that means. This is absolutely certain. If you have put your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you have already, in the present tense, with certainty, entered the salvation rest of God. But without skipping a beat, the author of Hebrews goes on and gives the negative side of the equation. Go on in that verse. It says, just as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. That's Psalm 95 again. Just as absolute as it is that those who believe will enter his rest, so those who do not believe will not enter his rest. MacArthur says both the positive and negative side of this truth are categorically absolutes. But at the end of verse 3, we see a shift, and that takes us to the second point in our outline, which is the portrayal. The last part of verse 3 gives us the transition. Look at it. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world... That, of course, is speaking of the rest of God 
at the complete completion of the creation of the world. And what is the author doing here? <coughs> He's using a rhetorical device that was common in that day called a verbal analogy. He's connecting Genesis 2-2 with Psalm 95 on the basis of the fact that those two passages both contain the word rest. In other words, he's associating this rest into which the wilderness wanderers failed to enter with the rest that God demonstrated at creation. This was a common rabbinic technique. Go on and look at verses 4 and 5. For he has thus said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. That's Genesis 2. And again, in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. That's Psalm 95. He's tying these two texts together and these two concepts together. And he's applying both of these to the gospel. The Sabbath rest was intended to be a symbol of the true rest to come in Christ. And it is important for us to note that in the same way that God rested at the completion of creation, so Jesus Christ declared it is finished from the cross. And in verse 3, the word finished is used, I believe, to show this connection. In other words, the Sabbath rest was a type for which the work of Christ on the cross was the antitype. The atoning work of Christ was the fulfillment of that symbol. The Sabbath rest at creation is the portrayal of the spiritual reality of the gospel in the New Testament. It is an illustration of it. And when we get to verse 10, we will read, For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. In the same way that God rested from his works at creation, so a repentant sinner must cease from doing his own good works and totally trust in the finished work of Christ. Now, the word for rested in verse 4, as I said, is kataposis. It does not mean that God was tired. It means he was fully satisfied. It means his work of creation was completely and perfectly done. And in the same way, when Christ proclaimed it is finished from the cross, it meant that the work of salvation was completely and perfectly done. There's nothing we can add to it. There's no way that we can supplement it. And it's completely done by Christ. We certainly don't need to try to add our own good works to that. We simply receive it by faith. But it is important for us to recognize that the concept of ceasing from work is the key concept of this passage. And in order for a person to be saved, they must cease from their own work and trust totally in God's work of salvation. And over and over again in this passage, we see the rest referred to as my rest. This is all of God. In the same way that God accomplished creation and then rested, so he accomplished our salvation in Christ Jesus. All of it is of God. But not not only do we see the promise and the portrayal, we also see the potential. Look with me at verses 6 and 7. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter it because of disobedience, he again fixes a certain day, today, saying through David, after so long a time, just as he as had been said before, today, if you hear his voice, Do not harden your hearts. Now, this is a recap of the urgent warning he had given before. Opportunity to enter into God's rest still remains, but it will not remain forever. There is a certain day that God has fixed for responding. 
It's called today. It is that limited opportunity to believe. We often call it the age of grace. For each individual, this time of opportunity will end at death. And for history as a whole, it will end at the second coming of Christ. But the point is, your opportunity will one day end. And if you have hardened your heart, like those in the Old Testament, and if you have failed to believe and put your faith and trust in Christ alone for salvation, your today will be over. God's today is always right now right now. That is the only opportunity we can be sure of. The fact that the opportunity was spoken of as still remaining in the days in which Hebrews was written makes it clear that this opportunity was not limited to the time of the wilderness wanderings, nor was it limited to the days in which David wrote Psalm 95. This truth was for the generation in which Hebrews was written, and it is for every generation as long as God's provision of salvation is available. It is still applicable today as I speak. In fact, go on to verse 8. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. Again, this can't be referring to the physical rest of entering the land of Canaan, that was only a picture of the spiritual rest to come. God's true rest did not come through Moses or Joshua or David. It came through Jesus Christ. It was available to those in the first century, and it is still available to us today. By the way, the King James Version has... Jesus in verse 8, that is a bad translation. Jesus is the equivalent of Yeshua, but it is the same name as Joshua. However, the context clearly refers to Joshua here and not to Jesus. F.F. F. Bruce writes, the revisers of 1611 would have done better to follow the precedent of Tyndale and Coverdale and Whittingham all of which used Joshua. And for my King James-only friends out there, this is just one example of why we have to acknowledge that no English translation is perfect, and this is why we have to go back to the original languages and why we need textual criticism to help us properly translate and interpret the Scripture. Now, I generally like the King James Version and think it is fairly accurate. But as with any translation, we have to be careful. And in this case, it clearly should read Joshua, not Jesus. It clearly points back to the time when Joshua led the people into the promised land. To use Jesus there makes no sense at all. Jesus did, in fact, give them spiritual rest, but that is not what the author of Hebrews is talking of here. Well, let's move on very quickly, fourthly, to the premise. Look with me at verse 9. There remains, therefore, a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Stop right there for just a moment. The phrase, people of God, is probably a reference to uh, Israel, which means he's directing this to his Jewish audience. But the New American Standard makes note of a change in terminology here. The author of Hebrews uses a different Greek word for rest. This is not kataposis. This is sab sabbatismos. This is a Sabbath kind of rest. And it's interesting, this is the only time this particular word appears in the New Testament. In all likelihood... This is the only time this word appears anywhere in Greek literature. In fact, this is a word that was most likely coined by the author of Hebrews. He made up a word for this purpose. And of course, we would have to say that 
This was a word that was inspired by the Holy Spirit, but it is very unique in its usage. Now, some scholars have said that this word is a parallel term for kataposis, but if that was the case, then why use such a unique term in this verse? Why not just go ahead and use kataposis? He's used that all the way through this passage. Why not just continue to use it if he intended the same thing? <clears throat> no, he clearly intends something unique through the use of this term. But what is his intention? It is clearly Sabbath rest, but what does this mean? Now, some scholars have taken this eschatologically. F.F. F. Bruce, for example, writes, when God completed his work of creation, he rested. So his people, having completed their service on earth, will enter into their rest. In other words, he's talking about heaven. Bruce couples that with verse 10, which says, For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. So he takes that to be a reference to heaven. He writes, in other words, he has completed his appointed work in accordance to God's will. Now, John MacArthur says, I believe Hebrews 4.10 anticipates that final day when we cease from all effort and all work and enter into the presence of Jesus Christ. He says, that is the reality of Sabbath rest. So that is certainly a possibility, but there might be another meaning. We know that the author of Hebrews is connecting the concept of rest with the concept of the Sabbath in this passage. And as George Guthrie points out, an important clue to the specific Sabbath that the author has in mind may be found in the book of Leviticus, where the Pentateuch also joins the concepts of ceasing work and the Sabbath. Turn with me for a moment, and I know we're going a little bit over time this morning, but turn with me to Leviticus chapter 23, and let's read beginning in verse 26. Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23, verse 26. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, On exactly the tenth day of this seventh month is the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you, and you shall humble your souls and present an offering by fire to the Lord. Neither shall you do any work on this same day, for it is a day of atonement to make atonement on your behalf before the Lord your God. Now drop down to verse 32. It is to be a Sabbath of complete rest to you, and you shall humble your souls on the ninth of the month at evening, from evening until evening you shall keep your Sabbath. Interestingly, here the Sabbath is directly associated with the Day of Atonement. It is connected with the high priestly offering to atone for sin. Is it possible this is what the author of Hebrews has in mind? Guthrie writes, In this interpretation, the Sabbath that remains for God's people is a new covenant Day of Atonement Sabbath in which they are cleansed from their sins. Now, that makes a whole lot of sense to me, especially in light of the broader message of this book. Because the author of Hebrews is going to go on and he's going to show that Jesus Christ is the perfect high priest who has atoned for our sins once and for all. And his use of the concept of Sabbath rest could very well be connected to the ultimate atonement of Christ. And if that is the case, then the ceasing from work would more likely refer to the ceasing of trying to earn one's own salvation through good works and the acceptance of the salvation by God's grace. Now, of course, we also know that the atonement of the believer, 
ultimately leads to the rest of heaven, and that we will one day cease from our earthly labors and will enter into that ultimate rest. We know that's true. And it's difficult, really, to say for certain what the author of Hebrews has in mind here exactly, but one thing appears to be clear. It is connected with the salvation of those who believe. And that leads us to our last point, which is the plea. Look with me at verse 11. Let us, therefore, be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall through following the same example of disobedience. He has already told us at the end of the previous chapter that those who uh, fail to enter this rest do so because of unbelief. This is an urgent exhortation to make sure you enter the rest of God and that you don't miss it through unbelief or disobedience or rebellion like the Israelites did in the Old Testament. The Greek word for be diligent is spudazo. It literally means to apply oneself fervently or to do one's best. It speaks of a focused attention to the accomplishment of a given task. In other words, this is not something that should be taken lightly. This is something that should be given the highest priority. This is like saying, whatever else you do, make sure you enter God's rest and that you don't fail to enter it because of unbelief. Those who failed to enter Canaan in the Old Testament did so because they did not believe God. They rebelled against his plan and disobeyed his word. And as a result, they were not allowed to enter into the promised land. In the same way, in this age of grace, in this day of New Testament revelation and eternal salvation that is available through faith in Jesus Christ, we need to make sure we attain that salvation rest. What about you this morning? Do you know that for sure? You have entered into God's rest. Oh, don't fall short of it. Don't fail to enter it. Make sure that you have entered that rest. Let's pray together. Father, we pray this morning you would help us to clearly understand this passage. And Lord, that uh, your Holy Spirit might use it in our lives. Help us to respond. I pray if there's someone here today that uh, has not settled that issue of salvation, has not uh, uh, repented of sin and put their full faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. I pray they would do that today. Lord, I pray that uh, your Holy Spirit would take your word, the sword of the Spirit, that you would use it in our hearts, that you would pierce all the way down to the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And Lord, I pray this morning that uh, we would respond that we would be willing to be convicted by your spirit and do what we know to do, to receive Christ or to uh, do something else in response today. So Lord, we ask it in Christ's name, amen. As always.